Hey everybody, Mark from Pistol Twist the Garage here. On this episode, I'm gonna take what we did in parts one and two with the Solex carburetor, which was the disassembly and the cleaning. And in part three, we're gonna reassemble it and put it back to factory tuned settings. I mentioned in part one about the abutment plate, and here's the non-standard one and the original. You'll see at the end of this video why I'll be using the original, but for now let's remove this non-standard one. I'll also be adding the drip tray along with the mounting hardware for it. Now starting out, the starting lever is not meant for a TRW, but a 3TA instead. And here's why this is important. The disc that the lever controls determines how rich the fuel mixture is. With the large window at the 6 o'clock position, we're at the starting stage. Rotating clockwise, you get to the mill running position, and the leaned out position for a warm running engine is next. With the lever as it is, these positions would be backwards, and you'll end up running an overly enriched engine full time, if you can even get it started. Here you see the correct setup for the Dutch Army 3TA, but not for a TRW. On the left is the setup you want for a TRW, on the right though is what you want for that venerable 3TA. Now in part 2 I took the assembly apart, and now the reassembly of it. With the washer in place, a hammer and punch are used to put the pin back into the assembly shaft, and then the spring is slid over it. To mount the plate I use a punch to peen the end of the shaft, preventing the plate from coming free. You'll need to do this for both the left and right side. And that's it. Now just for a closer comparison, the setup for this TRW Solex is on the right. And with all that out of the way, now we can move on to the assembly. It all starts with the body. I'll start by installing the choke tube with the fixing screw. Now as with previous parts in this series, the part numbers in red and the tools in blue are posted at the bottom of the screen for your convenience. The choke tube needs to be installed from the rear of the carb as shown. And the next is going to be the auxiliary jet. Now, you'll notice the option of a neoprene ring. I like adding this as it prevents fuel from leaking out and air from bleeding into the carb. With that installed, it's time for the petrol jet and the washer. With the throttle spindle, first I'll apply a thin coat of engine oil to the shaft and then rolling it forward and back, I'll slide it into the main body. With the beveled screw ends visible, I'll rotate them to the top of the carb, which is at the bottom of the screen, until the slit faces me. When installing the butterfly, you'll want the number 8 to face forward after assembly, so it'll be installed with a numbered side facing the top of the carb, again, the bottom of the screen. To prevent damaging the butterfly, I apply some tape to the end of my flat nose pliers to prevent any metal on metal scarring, and this also helps with grip. Entering from the front of the carb, I'll slide the butterfly into the slit of the spindle. Once it catches, I'll push the rest of the way with my fingers. It will take some attempts, but I'll keep pushing it until the butterfly and spindle freely rotate inside the carb. To align the holes for the fixing screws, I'll use a toothpick as it won't damage the threads. And once I'm happy, which is rare, I'll rotate the carb so the front faces upward, then install the two fixing screws. A little bit of tape on the end of the screwdriver helps with the installation process. After a quick check to make sure that the butterfly moves freely, I rotate the carb while holding the butterfly closed. Then moving onto the return spring side or left side of the carb, the original neoprene ring may be damaged, dried up, or missing. I found the best replacement for the original neoprene ring is a pair of 11 by 1.5 mm neoprene O-rings. With the two new O-rings in place, the two spindle distance washers are installed.
Next is the return spring. In its original form, the two hooks look like this, and the bent one goes towards the inside of the carb to hook onto a tooth. But alas, this body has no tooth. Never fear, Solex was brilliant. If this tooth is missing, there's a small hole beside it. Now, normally, this is what the tooth should look like. In the absence of the tooth, bend this part of the spring 90 degrees to look like this. Now this return spring will fit into the small hole, and crisis is averted. Verifying that the butterfly is closed, I attach the return lever with the notched side forward and facing up on the carb. After that, I put the spindle end nut on, but only finger tight at this point. To hook the spring, whether into a hole or tooth, a small flathead screwdriver is used to pull the spring over, and then I push the rest of it all the way to make sure that it's seated properly. On the other side of the spindle, another pair of replacement o-rings are installed, followed by the slow running adjustment lever, with the screw hole facing inward. Next is the abutment plate. Now notice the throttle cable attachment faces inward as well. These holes are an easy way to do major adjustment to take up slack on the throttle cable. I opt to go with the first hole to start with. This gets held in place with the other end nut, again only finger tight at this point. Lastly, I install the adjustment screw and spring. The initial setting should be just where the tip of the screw makes contact with the metal. Then both spindle end nuts are tightened down and that completes the throttle spindle assembly. The starter assembly begins with the valve plate and installation of the new air jet. Take note of the side of the face that the air jet is being installed on. Then the starter body is installed and I loosely hold it together with two of the smaller brass fixing screws. With those in place, the starter assembly is put in with the larger opening facing the front of the carb like this. Notice how I haven't put any additional gaskets between the plates and that's because there's simply no room or any need for them. Extra space would cause a gap between the starter assembly and the plate pieces causing an overly rich mixture to go into your engine. So again, as stated in part one, no gaskets here. Now once the fixing screws are all tightened down, I mark where the large opening is. This is in case it gets inadvertently rotated during assembly, I can set the plate back in the right direction. Now moving on to the main jet, that tape trick works well here too. After the main jet, the emulsion tube is next to be installed. Then the main jet correction bleed is installed into the top of the emulsion tube. Rotating the carb so that the front faces up, I can install the floats. The trick here is to install the spindles so that they stick out just enough that I can hook the float onto them, then tighten them down the rest of the way. And once installed, I verify that the float moves freely inside the bowl and doesn't get hung up on anything. Moving from the body to the float chamber cover, I start with installing the needle valve. Again, this one functions, but if you need a replacement, you can see that in part two, but I'll also leave a replacement part number in the video description, especially as this is the most common failure point in these Solex carburetors. Now, even though the original needle valve works, I'm using a new fiber washer for it. The gasket itself is also new. I've linked a video to show you how to make your own with some additional info in the video description here. 
Although the original hammer drive screws are hard to come by, listed here is the Triumph replacement. They're brass, but they work just the same as the originals. With all that finished, the chamber cover can now be installed on the body. Now normally I'd oil the gasket at this point, but as this one's going to be going in the mail and I don't know when the owner's going to be installing it on the bike, I'm going to send it dry. Prior to installing the remaining pieces on the starter lever, I'll apply a bit of oil inside the cavity for the spring. This is to help prevent the spring from corroding over time. A new neoprene ring and copper washer are installed, followed by the spring and ball. The final spindle washer and the correct lever and that's all held in place with the final end nut. Now the nut is tightened until there's no wobble in the lever when I'm moving it between the three positions. Flipping the Solex over so that the front face is facing upwards, I can install the volume control screw and spring carefully. To dial the Solex in for initial factory setup, you want to turn the volume control screw until you feel a slight resistance where it bottoms out. From there, back it off two and a half turns and your carb is set to initial factory tuning. The throttle cable abutment plate is installed. Now remember at the beginning when I mentioned how important the original one was? Well watch this amazing focus pull and see that hole in this plate needs to align vertically with where the end of the cable attaches to the spindle like here. This will ensure you have a nice smooth throttle response without any risk of binding or wear to the cable. Lastly the drip tray is installed to make sure that no fuel spills onto the distributor or magneto on the TRW. That's the assembly and factory tuning of a Solex carb. If you've got any questions or comments, drop it in the comment section below. I love hearing from you. Hit that like and subscribe button along with the notification bell. And thanks for watching. Cheers.